February 2nd, uh, 2023, Stormwater Management Advisory Commission meeting. Thank you all for being here. Um, the only excused absence is Reverend Taylor, who is still on work sabbatical. So that's, um, we haven't heard from him, and that's a good sign. Join us on the way at time as well. Um, minutes for approval. Uh, they were sent out Wayne's packet. Would you want to do a, um, a motion in a second, too? Oh, uh, we have a so, Yes, I'll make it so official. Um, all right, so a motion to excuse Reverend Taylor. Second. All in favor? No opposed. Thank you both. Mark and Nicola. Um, minutes for approval. Anybody have any comments on the minutes? And if no comments are received, then we can motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. All in. All in favor? Okay. Uh, to the minutes. Okay, we have a public comment period open. If there is anyone here to speak, it's an in person meeting. So no one has signed no up. No one signed up to speak. Okay. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, we will not waste time with that. Uh, let's see, Planning Commission and SMAC liaison comments, Nicola and yeah. Ben. Um, so I think we did do a presentation, very formal, but Ben put Jan's new presentation that I wanted to, I was like, this shouldn't just be for me seeing it, everyone should be able to see it. And I think kind of that just with this one was that we had quite a few things in the docket and kind of recently we've had a number of places. And I think just seeing a visual of where those are located, um, it helps me and I really kind of put this a uh, nice presentation together, so I thought it'd be, it'd be nice to kind of have that as well, and then um, kind of pass it, pass it to the um, so who actually was going on the repeat here, the pass it guy. And just real quick, it just because I didn't know this, but you guys are working together to meetings to, to track development, so just so that the commission knows they are talking quite a bit, and so they're kind of giving each other information back so that something doesn't get missed. So I appreciate your collaboration. Um. Dark colors and power. Anyway, um, <laughs> so this is kind of a summary. I'm not going to go through it in that much detail. I'm just going to write the map, so I'll kind of keep this as short as we can. But just, just to kind of get everybody kind of where we are, is the city council does public hearings for rezonings and annexations uh, twice a month, and it's an evening meeting uh, the first Tuesday of the month, and it's a afternoon meeting the second Tuesday. Of the month. Well, the January. Third meeting got uh, didn't get publicly noticed correctly, so they couldn't have their evening public hearing. So that got pushed back to January twenty fourth. So that's why it's kind of weird. They don't usually have council meetings back to back on January seventeenth and January twenty fourth. So that's why that was kind of. Uh, but I'll go, but I'll go through each one, and I've got some decent pictures. Okay. Um, so this one is an annexation. Uh, for uh, the corner of Strickland Road and Six Forks, uh, the northeast corner. And this uh, property has been vacant for a while, and it's in our watershed by watershed. And it's not vacant, sorry, there's a single house on it, but largely vacant. And it's been the subject of numerous rezoning attempts to kind of do some sort of development on, on it over the past like probably five years, if not longer back. Um, and those have all kind of failed because um, of the council policies not. Allow anything inside of residential zoning inside the worship by worship. But that's a policy, not a regulation. So theoretically, they could waiver on that if they wanted to. That's why. Um, so what this was doing, it's in the ETJ, and there's going to be a development plan coming on this. And that's the reason for the annexation. But they're proposing to put a church on there, which is under residential zoning is an allowed use. Churches and schools and residential institutions. So maybe we build on residential zone. So that's kind of what is happening there. Now they will be subject to all the Falls Lake rules. Nothing changes about that or anything like that. They'll have to um, they'll have to hook up to water and sewer to build to to over 12% impervious to go from 12 to 24 percent They'll have to do some sort of stormwater treatment device. And to go from 24% to 30% impervious they'll have to use some sort of green stormwater. In infrastructure device. So 
and 30 is their maximum and they have a 40 percent um four station requirement on top of that so but it will be coming in to develop as um a church of some sort um next one is a standard rezoning uh basically for uh, area southeast town of the old pool road near old pool road and pool road kind of where that intersection ends and um the only reason i kind of flagged this to uh talk about was that it's a fairly large property but it does have a hundred year detention requirement on it because of structural flooding downstream so they will have to match pre development flows up to the hundred year show for any developments on this property and since it is vacant that will be a decent one to do that. Uh, this uh, next one is a case out in kind of the eastern side of the uh, ETJ um, and subject to to our normal stormwater requirements. This one got put on the list because uh, through uh, through a new council member patent, there were some neighborhood concerns about this one. And uh, it was deferred to the March 31st public hearing for various such issues, not just stormwater, but they'll, but they'll be talking about that at the March 21st uh, city council meeting. So we could get some stormwater concerns on, on that. This is a fairly new development over the past couple of years that just rezoned and then developed. So some of the neighbors that are in the county and in, in this previous neighborhood have raised concerns about poor construction. Oh, and I'm the one for this one. That was approved, so that won't be talked about at city council anymore. So just the first two were approved, the annexation and this one. And this is the first one they got deferred to a March 31st council meeting. So this one was an interesting one, which depending on where you came from today, you might have driven past <laughs> like I did. Um, it's on Clover Lane, which is off of Wake Forest Road in the Mordecai neighborhood of town. Um, there are existing right now an apartment complex here. It's like a garden, like it's like 1970s garden style apartments. They're like two story town hall looking apartments. And um, they want to go back and put uh, larger apartment buildings. And in order to do that, they would have to rezone to a different zoning uh, later now because per the plan department, what this property is on now is not even zoned for the use it's, it's it's happening now so it's a so it's existing non conformity so um as i told people yesterday that's not a good thing when you see all this on the map <laughs> all these aspects <laughs> so there's a lot of trade issues downstream and um as such uh they will have to meet the 100 year detention um just requirement as well and all these neighbors are nervous about more dense development and more taller development coming in. So, um, and just as a side note, this house right here has actually been in for development for just like a porch within the past four years, probably, because I met with him before COVID. And uh, his house, which is an old house, is sitting on top of 30 inch pipe. So, which we would not allow that. Yeah, now we would not allow it. Not even in March time. As part as part of the development plan, separate from the rezoning, if it's approved, uh, staff would try to make them kind of reroute this area, or maybe fill this with some slow yeah. fill to kind of get rid of this active drainage short drainage by three things. But but this is an interesting case because there's a lot of neighborhood opposition to it and. Uh, some of it's stormwater, but obviously we kind of know the issues like the stormwater out there and they're taking the, the extra attention um, just requirements seriously, but there's also some high issues that the neighbors are worried about because right now they're two story townhomes basically, and then it'd be replaced with five, we say five story apartment. The detention requirement then, is that for, have to meet 100 years for their existing runoffs, so it would be undeveloped conditions it would be for above and beyond what they have yes yeah, so that's a great point and i made it yesterday but i forgot today it's the additional runoffs like excuse me the additional, the, the additional purpose area so that's the only caveat to this one is it is an already developed parcel with parking there's a decent amount of purpose out there already so, so if they can figure it five story they might be able to say they're part of these yeah <clears throat> I don't think I asked this 
um, earlier, but I know you mentioned the um, kind of redoing or kind of reevaluating that 30 inch pipe, maybe it was rerouting it. Mm -hmm. if, would that be with or without this approval? Is that like apart from uh, or if they need to develop can? Okay, so if it stayed as is, though, if it was not approved in that scenario, then you wouldn't. Correct. Like if there's no work being done, uh, like on the property, we can't. I tread lightly here, compel anyone to fix that for us. But if they're doing development work, we can kind of ask them to reroute it somewhere so they're mutually amenable to that. Uh, but this got referred to um, Council Committee, specifically the Growth and Natural Resources Committee. And their first meeting will be February 28th at 4 p.m. And there's a lot of stuff that got referred to that committee. So it, it probably won't all get talked about at that one meeting. But we'll see. That was brought up at the council table. If they're concerned that they were sending a lot of stuff to this one committee, and they might get bothered. So, did that just get referred for general or just specific concerns? Why did it come in? Uh, neighborhood concern with height and traffic, and, and probably a little bit of strong work. I had to look at exactly to adapt. Um, this, is a, this is actually a rezoning case. That um, Chair Taylor had asked, asked about a few months ago. So we may have discussed this, not in this kind of map setting, but it's a uh, fairly large zone with 31 acres, kind of adjacent to Tix Park and the uh, farmers market here. The farmers market park is here, Tix Park is here, and South Saunders and Lake Miller Road. Uh, basically, a collection of these parcels, in, like industrial, residential, commercial, kind of mixing up to kind of do a more unified like rezoning. A lot of these parcels, these larger parcels, are owned by Baker Roofing. And, then, and then, like I think they're looking to actually sell this property and move somewhere else, but you know, tied into what their business plans are. But um, they're looking to rezone it to something that would be more urban and potentially could build up to those 20 stories. So this this got a lot of attention at the, at the council table. Not so much for stormwater, but it does have a GSI condition on it. That if they submit for a certain site plan size, they will have to treat with green stormwater infrastructure. So that's not the stormwater wasn't why this got sent to the GNR committee, the Growth Natural Resources Committee, but that was a, a key piece with the, the GSI condition and one kind of bring the kind of attention. But set in the middle, the red. Uh, that would just kind of be centering myself when I was drawing it. It's the shaky line of my hands on the line right? <laughs> approximately where the rezoning is. But this is one of the Baker roofing properties. So. And it does cut through some of these residential properties too. So it's, it's, it's kind of an odd zone. And then this one was also one that I think we gave an update to a few months ago. Z5322. It's a city. Initiated rezoning of, of uh, three properties here, here, here. And essentially, um, the city council addressed the plan department to kind of present some properties for possibly for affordable housing. And this is kind of the first round of these properties mm -hmm. that is being presented. Um, the most uh, discussion was about the big property here because the present floodplain. Um, I will say this flat area or this non colored area here, which is non floodplain, is about 15, 12, 15 feet higher than the actual floodplain. So we think there might be some buildable area on this area for housing or apartments, but, but it is all wooded now. So, um, so essentially, what the council did was they, they had a lot of questions about this property. Didn't really like this property at all, and the planning commission and even some staff members agreed. So that'll probably fall out of being even used for any development. And everybody thought this property was suited to put something on, but it's too high. So essentially, what the council did is approve this property being rezoned and refer these two to um, council committee growth and natural resources to kind of talk about more. And there is a few. Uh, a field visit tomorrow with a couple of council members in Wayne uh, to talk about to meet on site and talk about the viability of the site and if it's doable and that sort of thing. And then another big one, which um, some of you may have heard about, was the Dix Edge study. 
uh, that was talked about. Um, it's been a fairly lengthy process. And this area here is where that other zone was. And so the Dixet study covers a whole host of issues about kind of recommendations for street sections and development trends and things like that, and future land use and things like that. And so um, a lot of newer council members hadn't really weren't intimately aware of the Dick's Edge study and the ins and outs of it. So it seemed like they wanted to get more of their hands around it before they approved it and uh, and talk about it a little bit more. So they went, so that got, so that got referred to the GRP as well. And as I said yesterday, if I were a betting man, I bet this definitely gets talked about at that very 28th meeting. I'm not sure about the rest. But that was pretty much it. That's usually, that's a lot more than usual, <laughs> hopefully. But uh, I think yeah, just the mapping really puts it into context. I think and I, just some of those larger parcels. Because you, you talked about a few of them before you kind of presented a few of them, but just seeing kind of the scale and location, and all of them kind of really located very similar locations, I thought was really interesting. It's, you know, you kind of have like just that one little snippet to put into context while they're really considering um, quite a few things with downstream implications and. Um, yeah, they do a great job of explaining it, but we can have highlighting them. So definitely kudos um, to them, not so late for bringing that up. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. This was very helpful to see it. There you go. Thank you for the text change that you made. Thank you for that. Um, take a quick moment, I believe, before Wayne does a stormwater team update. We're going to recognize one of our members who is rolling off our Commission, so Katie, a certificate here for your two years of service. Thank you very much for this. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. Sorry. You can't leave exactly yet until someone comes in to replace you. <laughs> At this point, I don't think we have an exact replacement. No, I know you're hoping for one soon. <laughs> sure, I'm so glad. Thank you. For I'm going back to the real quick. Yeah, the question on that one we got on the downstream problems, Ben, is there any chance the city could work with that developer to try to come in above and beyond intention to try to improve that instead of us have to fix stuff downstream? Over I think it was like slide four ish. It's not. Yeah, I'm going to. It's going to the board keyboard. One more. If you want to redevelop that whole thing, it might have enough room to put something substantial in there. Just think, yeah, I mean, about that. since it's at the council committee, that is definitely something that could that could be put on to the case because the hundred years of now is just the BDO on it right now. But yeah, that's definitely something that they could look at. And um, one thing I'm worried about is treating for the existing impervious. I don't want to. Advertise that right now. That's kind of a contentious issue statewide right now. Yeah. So, but, and, and but it's a rezoning of whatever it is involved. So it's just correct. correct. And this is a is this a conditional rezoning or yes, it's, uh, it's not a uh, it's not a PUD. It's not a plan development. It's no, no, it's not a plan development. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's a conditional. But the hundred year comes from a UDO requirement. Maybe just clarify. Yes. Clarify. Yeah. So the hundred year decision requirement comes from a UDO section. Specifically talking about the uh, downstream flood for flood. So anything above the on that could be his own condition, yeah. And if that's something uh, the commission would like to recommend or something, I don't know. I don't know it's a short turnaround. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's something recommend to something to offer up that if we Interesting concept that if they want to entertain it, you can sweep the pot by saying we're trying to do something to improve that downstream situation. I think great infrastructure and more detention are two ways to sweep the pot, right? Yep. Yeah, the only thing I, that we were talking about yesterday, like we went up in the map, clearly the grade is not conducive to having the water go up here because that would be ideal if the water could just go up to see if that's true. That's actually, so. But yeah, some sort of infrastructure improvement too would be something worth looking into. And remind me again, the hundred year detention, that's standard, but the potential change would be the amount that they would be like impervious that they would be applying. Correct. Yeah. So like so like on the um 
but on the other, so like on on yeah. this side, that's completely vacant. It's got the hundred year <laughs> detention just requirement on it as well. But any impervious it has is going to be right. treated. Whereas yeah. this one is already developed. Like Mark said, they might be built something that doesn't that doesn't exceed their impervious. That's currently that we're going right now. So. And, and just to clarify too, and I think we've mentioned this before, but um, to emphasize it, there is a state law that says local governments may not require stormwater controls on any existing impervious area as part of redevelopment. So even if we wanted to implement something that would require stormwater controls, that would be illegal for the city of Raleigh to, to do. Yeah, we have the law passed in twenty nineteen. 2019, I believe, or 2017. 2017. Yeah, I think. That's why I have to acknowledge our ambition. Yeah, correct. Right. That's additional result. Right. That's what. What's well, another? There's a bill to that's going through this year. Want to take that away? So, not sure going to pass, but <laughs> we've, we've heard that a bill will be introduced this yeah. year to repeal yeah. that um, inability for local governments to pass that. Now, if that were repealed, we would still need to pass, pass that locally, yeah. but then. If it was repealed, we, we could pass it locally, right? If we if council wanted to. And then just the other quick thing, just from a recap, conditions of rezoning must be voluntarily offered, right? The city cannot say we're not going to rezone this unless you offer this condition. <laughs> it's kind of a subtle difference. Um now the the residents and neighbors can make suggestions and so say this is an issue and potentially influence council to say this is something we'd like to see but in the end it must be a voluntarily offered condition it can't be the requirement because then we would be requiring stormwater treatment you know of an existing impervious area yeah so i think wayne Stormwater team updates. And I'm following um, the, the new protocols. I'm having slides. I'm going to do slides for this, <laughs> this element too. And so we've, uh, as part of the staff updates, we did go through a reorganization that was approved and implemented just a few days after the last commission meeting. So we thought we'd go ahead and bring it up and announce it today. There's a lot of information. I'm not going to go through the whole organization. Obviously, if you would like more feedback on that, we can we can do that. But I will go through the basic organization and, and the changes that, that we've made. So previously, we have had three groups that are each led by stormwater administrators. Those stormwater administrators are Ben Brown. And um, Ben is over all of the development management, development inspections, floodplain management, stormwater control measure compliance. Okay. Um, Scott Bryant, who is out today ill, um, but um, Scott is over all the, bi the business and financial aspects, administration, rate modeling, um, the um, stormwater fee accounts, the accounting part that brings in our, our revenues as well as the flood early warning system. That's under Scott Bryant. And then Money Kumar is over all of the CIP and infrastructure, which includes the drainage assistance program and all of the other um, flood control, lake improvements, the big capital improvements project and the project managers that implement those projects. That's money. Now, the reorganization is creating a fourth um, administration position, stormwater administrator, and the new administrator is Barbara Maranta, who you have seen many presentations recently. And Barbara will be managing the watershed planning and asset management group now. So we thought it made sense to bring that out into its own its, its own group, elevate that as something that's um, emphasizing. Uh, more emphasis and coordination between the watershed planning and the water quality group will also be under under Barbara. That's all the NPDES MS4 compliance group, um, the rainwater rewards program, the IDDE program, 
um, as well as all the public education and other stream restoration programs so that those are coordinated with watershed planning. So that's the, the big part of the reorganization. And now I'll read um, Barbara's bio. Um, this new stormwater position administers watershed planning, GIS, technology programs, asset management, um, and the water quality program. Barbara was the engineering supervisor for all of those same elements. Um, she's been with Raleigh Stormwater almost four years and has 23 years of professional experience. So congratulations and thank you, Barbara. Within Barbara's group, we've also, these highlights are the reclassification positions, the, the positions of reclassifying. Something that we've done as part of um, our asset management plan implementation is a number of these um, GIS related positions were in the engineering job class. That was done a number of years ago because those, um, those folks did lots of different things. They would go out to lakes and open up valves and they would go do a lot of field work for, for whatever was needed. With our asset management plan, we much better defined the roles of the information elements and data management elements of those jobs. So we're moving them into more of a data information centric job classification, um, which has salaries, which goes along with those lines, which um, you know, there can be a different salary structure than engineering and also reflects job and career growth that they may go more toward an, an IT job, you know, in within within the city. So we've reclassified three of our team members in that group, starting at the top with, with Brad Stewart. And he's been promoted to stormwater analyst senior. He supervises the GIS and technology group, will provide project management support division-wide to implement implementation of GIS and technology projects. He served with the city of Raleigh Stormwater for almost 15 years, um, and more recently as project manager for our asset management um, project and program. Prior to that, Brad worked for the city of Greensboro Stormwater Division for seven years. So that's a promotion for Brad. And then two other team uh, members under Brad, John Paramore has been um, promoted to GIS analyst, has, uh, provides analysis mapping application development um, for the division. Um, including working closely with the transportation field services here on all the applications that they use for data collection and analysis related to asset management. Um, and uh, Jonathan served with the division for over 15 years, initially as a senior inventory technician, and most recently as a GIS specialist. And um, previous history um, prior to the city includes more than five years in IT management and five years in land surveying. And then um, Matt Cherry has also been promoted to a GIS analyst within this group. Um, this position will provide database administration, GIS data sets, and be the technical lead on projects and manage the field data collection program. He's been with the city for almost 13 years, initially as a field crew leader within the GIS program. And other roles um, he has had are, are engineering technician in the business services group, and his current position of engineering support super, supervisor for asset management. Prior to joining the city, he worked for an engineering consulting firm um, in the water resources group for, for six years. So that's this, this team. Um, and then the other part of the reclassification and reorganization has been in, in Ben's group related to the development inspections group. Um, you, you heard from and know Lauren Witherspoon, who manages that group under Ben. Previously, she had eight direct reports. So we have reorganized her group into three teams and provided an increased structure um, with um, succession planning and career growth opportunities within each of those groups. So we have an engineering specialist, a senior specialist, and an engineering support supervisor. And so in order to get that structure within each of the three teams, we've um, reclassified four positions. One was vacant, but the other three um, I would I would like to mention. Um, so Chris Bridgers has been promoted from a senior engineering specialist to a support supervisor. He has 17 years of stormwater experience, the last 15 with our stormwater division as a team lead. And uh, Chris will supervise the team responsible for development inspections in the western part of the city. 
And then Steve Leshner um, has also been promoted to engineering senior, um, senior engineering specialist um, to a support supervisor. He's been with the city for 28 years, the last 26 years in the stormwater division as an inspector and team lead. And he will supervise the team um, responsible for the, the eastern portion of the city. And, um, and then Eric Christopher has also been promoted from an engineering specialist to a senior engineering specialist. Eric has been um, with us for 18 years. Um, I'm sorry, 18 years of experience, the last 15 with the stormwater division um, as uh, an inspector, and he'll be an ex technical expert for this team. So um, thank you for bearing with me. You know, this is really, I think, a, a major reorganization for us. Um, we're a growing division. I think this gives us an opportunity for continued growth um, and an emphasis of these different uh, teams. One other key element of this that I think was was important was we're a very technical oriented division. Lots of engineers, lots of specialists. Um, but what we also wanted to do was create a job growth opportunity for non engineers to advance to administrator um, level position. So Scott Bryant is an engineer and an MBA. Okay, so Scott's a, I call him a unicorn because he's got both of those qualifications. Um, but we wanted that, that administrator to not necessarily have to have an engineering background. So the functions that we put in this group are the fiscal, the business, so that there'd be career job opportunity and growth for folks in that part of the of the division to get to that administrator level without having to be an, an engineer. So that was another part of, of this reorganization that we, we thought was important. I'll stop there. If there's any questions, be glad to take those now. And if if it would, would be helpful to be sure to get into more details because there's a lot more we can talk about it, about our organization as well. Could you send us a copy of that? Absolutely. Email. Absolutely. Well, and yeah, we'll we'll put it in the in with the minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have some vacancies here, and we we do we do have some vacancies. A couple of these vacancies we intentionally kept vacant until we would reclassify those positions. Um, we do have some other vacancies, and as you've heard over the last few months. We've had a number of promotions and a number of those have been internal, which is, which is a good thing. Um, but what that does is when we're promoting within from a vacancy, we create another vacancy. Um, so, what, you know, I think we have, we have promoted people, but we're, we're also bringing some people in from the outside. It's a good mix. I think we have. Eight or nine, I think nine vacancies, nine vacancies right now out of 75 people. So a little over 10 percent is probably a little more than we would like. Um, but we're starting to see good numbers of applications pick up. So we're comfortable that we're going to get back to a more normal, what I would call a normal vacancy rate, just kind of a normal turnover might be in the four or five vacancies at any point in time. So we'd like that to be our goal to get down to that. I think we can do that within the next. Six to eight months or so. But across the city, there's definitely been a lot of challenges um, with make higher rates of vacancies uh, across the, the city. Um, and I think other departments are really seeing some impacts from that. So there's been an increased concerted effort of hiring, retention, engagement uh, across the city as, as well. It's very impressive. <laughs> thank you. You're doing a great job. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, be glad if anybody has any follow up questions, drop me an email. We'll send you this if you know you want to take a look at it. It's a it's a fairly complex organization for how com compact we are. <laughs> really. But it's, it's interesting. It makes it fun. Thank you. That's okay. very helpful. And another uh I think you may be up on that. World Wetland Day competition. Oh, that's going to be Ariel. Let me turn it over to Ariel to so make that announcement. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Ariel Michelle, and I am the communications analyst for Stormwater. Um, and it just so happened that today, along with the SMAC meeting and Groundhog Day and 
maybe something else, I'm sure. <laughs> it's also World Wetlands Day. Um, so I just wanted to give a couple highlights of what Raleigh is currently doing um, in regards to wetlands and also what's upcoming um, in this year and also future years coming ahead. Um, so just to start on what the benefits are for wetlands. Um, of course, some of us may know this, but um, it helps with erosion control with slowing down the speed of water um, passing through streams. And also um, it decreases the rate of erosion. It also provides um, habitat resources for plants and animals and increases biodiversity. Um, also, it helps with flood mitigation. Whenever it's a rainy day like today, um, it, it traps the water and helps it um, stay contained so that it's not um, overflowing into other um, local streams. And then also it helps with pollution reduction. Um, the, the plants that are in there soak up um, the water and also filters out the pollution um, to help the water stay clean um, for other local streams and creeks that are nearby. Um, and so we just have a couple highlights for wild, uh, Raleigh wetland projects. Um, two recent uh, recently completed projects. One is um, in Wooten Meadow Park, and also we have a second one that you guys have seen, uh, the Walnut Creek Wetland Park. Um, the Wooten Meadow Park um, is a wetland that provides um, habitat diversity and also mitigates flooding in the Hare Snipe Creek um, area. And then also the Walnut Creek Wetland Park is a subsurface gravel wetland that filters the stormwater runoff um, and again helps slow down um, that water before reaching um, Walnut Creek. And then we also have two upcoming projects that are in the works right now. One is the Upper Durant Lake Wetland Conversion, um, which will convert the existing Upper Durant Lake into a sustainable and resilient wetland system. And it's aimed to improve water quality and also increase habitat diversity. And then we also have um, the Fletcher Wetland as well coming up. And um, the city actually did investigations and realized that it needed um, a lot of repairs. It was just overgrown and there were some invasive plant species that um, were in the wetland. So they're going to be um, doing those repairs, cleaning it out, um, getting some sediment out of the wetland and replacing it with um, plants that are will be helpful for cleaning um, the water in, in that system. Just to clarify, that's not a wetland, it's flood that's a water garden. <laughs> <laughs> we have water time selling that product. Right. Well, I'll, I'll change this name to water. <laughs> so they know it's a lot of wet. Yeah. So we said wet and we got chased out of the room. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, and also coming up, obviously, we want to promote education um, with any project that we're doing. Um, but for the Water Creek um, gravel wetland, we do have coming in March a GSI educational display. Um, and it will be a concrete structure that will have a seating area and also um, a window that you can look through to see the actual wetland and also some um, educational text on there to talk about the wetland. So we're looking forward to that being installed and hopefully um, in the spring, there will be a lot of people that will take a look um, at you know, what's going on and what's being grown um, in the wetland. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of highlight that and just promote that, you know, Raleigh is, is really trying to grow um, our areas with, with wetlands and hoping that, you know, we continue to have more products for this. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy World Wetland Day. <laughs> Wayne, notice prior to construction? Um, I have none to report at this time. Okay. All right, I think you're about to stand up for the yes. budgetary fiscal and CIP development approach and processes. So Scott Bryant's here, um, but yet he is out sick. So Wayne and Barbara will be Javier and Cheryl will all be maybe just Wayne. All right. Let's see. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start off. All right, well, thanks everyone. Um, so, um, we are going to give this press this is going to be a two part series related to the budget development process. So this presentation is going to be an overview where we're going to talk about 
CIP operations, what the difference is, how we go through that budgeting process. Um, and then next month in March is going to be a presentation focused on some specific recommendations for fiscal year 24, which starts July 1st of this year. And um, at that point in time, we'll be asking for some feedback from the commission on priorities and, 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 and budget and CIP projects before we take that to the city council, um, which will be our formal presentation as part of the budgeting process. And then ultimately our um, budget gets rolled up into the entire city's budget, which then must be approved by city council prior to the end of this fiscal year. So prior to June 30th, they usually do that sometime in, in April or, or, or May. So um, the commission does have a formal role and uh, duties. And I know everyone has memorized that book that we gave you at the beginning, but I thought I might just read it for everyone else's um, benefit. So the duties of the Stormwater Management Advisory Commission, especially those related to budget, are the commission shall review and recommend to the council stormwater management policies, policy changes, long-range plans, and their budgetary and rate impacts is um, duty number one. Duty number two is the commission shall review and comment to the council on the annual stormwater management capital improvements program. So those will be next month that we'll be bringing you the information to provide for that. This month, though, we wanted to go through just the background to help prepare you for what the process means to give you context then for, for, for next month. And you have two other duties too. Um, commission shall respond to city council and staff request for advice on matters related to stormwater services and assorted stormwater management utility, which is an ongoing process. And commission shall present the council with an annual report of key actions and issues um, in its annual work program, which you have, you have done consistently every, every year. Any questions so, so far? Okay. Let me review the mission. I think whenever we talk about budgeting, budgeting's about priorities and meeting the mission. So always good to review um, our mission to manage stormwater, preserve, protect life, support healthy natural resources, and complement sustainable growth for the, the community. You've heard the vision, be the smartest stormwater program possible to economically and ed equitably achieve our mission. In short, to be stormwater smart. That's what we're working for every day. And you've seen this chart where we try to apply the stormwater smart philosophy to all of the different program elements um, that, that we do. And the context of the org chart I showed you earlier starts to give you a little bit of an understanding of where all those different elements fit within the organization and the people um, that, that, that do that, that very important work all in support of that of that mission. So this is something that we have done um, and used as part of our internal business planning process. Um, we call them critical success factors. Um, and you've all, you, you will recognize some of these because you we integrate these into our, our themes of our lot a lot of our presentations. The two specifically that relate to the budgeting process are one, Understand the level of service needs and expectations of the community and set our priorities, resources, and budgets accordingly. And this is part of where SMAC comes in. The commission is the standing stakeholders group that represents the community, can, can give um, consistent feedback from, a, from an educated and widely um, background um, viewpoint. So it's a very valuable process for us. Um, Meet all state regulatory federal requirements, deliver integrated services and projects through collaboration across the division and citywide programs, implement a high quality data driven innovative program through continuous improvement. And then here's the other specific budget related one be good stewards of staff, budgetary, and environmental resources. So we want to be efficient and effective at how we, we use our budget and implement our programs. And then finally, build trust with the community through engagement, awareness, and education of our program mission goals and objectives. 
the distrust and the, in this input from the community and engagement with the community is helps. What helps us do this better? Understand the expectations. So this is really kind of a, a loop in terms of these critical success factors. Here's the agenda. We're going to talk about the utility fee. Let's talk about some of the structure of that. Um, talk about operational and CIP budget planning. Some updates on the CIP financing strategy. Talk about some grant pursuits and successes, and then CIP planning uh, process and enhancements. I'll get this started. I'm going to turn it over to Javier Achana shortly. If you know Javier, Javier is our lead fiscal analyst for the stormwater program. He's the one that makes the rate model sing. He's the project manager for the work where we're working on debt financing. He also manages um, the work with a grants consultant who's been helping us seek and secure grants. So that's Javier's role in the organization. Then Barbara is going to talk about specifically the CIP planning and the prioritization and some things we're looking at in terms of debt financing. And you know Barbara's role now. In addition to her administrator, new administrator role, she as watershed planning helps develop the CIP projects and then helps prioritize those and put those into a CIP plan, which will show more detail for next next year uh, next month, um, fiscal year twenty four. But she's going to start doing an introduction that will help us get into that. So we thought we'd go back to the basics because we have some some new new folks here. How does stormwater get most of its revenues? Okay, so we do have what's called a stormwater utility that is funded by a fee that is collected, and the amount of that fee is collected from every property that has impervious area on it, and it's roughly proportionate to the amount of impervious area. So commercial areas with big parking lots pay more stormwater fee than a house on a single family. Family lot, okay, and here's how that works. So we um, consultants back in 2002 and three did studies that determined um, the median single-family house in Raleigh had an impervious area of 2,260 square feet. Okay, and so we define that amount of square foot of impervious area as a single-family equivalent unit. And that was hard back in 2003 because the GIS was in its it, it very, um, it, it, you know, very early. Now we have much more sophisticated aerial mapping and automation tools that we can update the impervious area for, for every parcel in the, in the city much more easily than we could, we could now or than we could then. Um, but what this single family equivalent unit is how we set the, the fee. And you've, you've seen this for FY23, that fee is $7.18 per month per single family equivalent unit. Okay. Now, how we apply that to commercial properties is we, using aerial photography and automated mapping, we measure the amount of square feet for every commercial parcel. And in this situation, which this is some type of a commercial building with parking all the way around, pretty typical from what you've seen, that has 47,303 square feet of impervious area. Okay. So we divide that amount by this block unit, 2,260 single family equivalent units, and, and we figure out that that equals 20.93 single family equivalent units. So how do we determine their fee? We multiply that 20.93 times the $7.18. And so they pay $150.28 every month. And this is collected on the water bill. So Raleigh Water bills this for us. It's the same bill as your, your water, your sewer, your solid waste fee, your stormwater fee. There's a few accounts that don't have stormwater. That's that's a whole other presentation I can do one day. A um, little harder, but still, this is all collected by Raleigh Water, the majority of it. Any questions about that? Even in residential, we have tiers. Okay, so what I just described to you is what we call tier two, and that's the majority of of residences in, in, in Raleigh. That's from 
1,000 square feet to 3780 square feet. The smaller ones that only have 400 to 1,000 square feet, they only pay $2.87. If you have less than 400 square feet, you don't pay anything. Okay, so very small parcel, maybe it doesn't have much square feet. Um, tier three pays 1221, tier four pays $20.82. And then there's actually a tier five with really large houses. They're treated just like the commercial. Calculate the impervious area, we divide it by 2260, and that's how and that's how much determines how much they they, they pay. Here's a pie chart that shows how that breaks down in terms of where we, we collect our money. So the blue, that's all of the commercial fees. Okay. The yellow is the tier two. Like I said, that's the most of our residential are in that tier two category. So we have a few tier ones. We have a few tier threes and tier fours and a little bit of tier fives, but two thirds is commercial. So that's the big parking lots, the big warehouses, the big buildings. So when we did the original analysis for Raleigh, Raleigh was paying a homeowner fee from property taxes. And this breakdown, if you base it on property taxes, would be about half of, of the fees would come from commercial and about half would come from residential. So by converting to an impervious surface-based fee, um, we believe it made it more fair because I think an impervious surface is a good proxy for downstream stormwater impacts, but it also had the effect of shifting more of the revenue to come from commercial and less from residential. If that makes if that makes sense. And that was a big that was a big change for Raleigh um, back when Mark and I went all the work on this because I was a consultant that helped <laughs> help do that. <laughs> It was an interesting process. It's just a little quick history. The stakeholders group in that process is what became SMAC. So that's that's your origin is the stakeholder group from that stormwater utility process. And now it's time to turn it to Javier. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Um, hello, committee. My name is Javier Chanis, like um, we just mentioned. I'm the fiscal analyst uh, for Stormwater Division. So I'm going to be taking a dive deep into, not, not too deep, just slightly, uh, into the fiscal and finance uh, component of what makes up our stormwater division. Uh, and Wayne, anything I missed, please uh, you know, chime in. Um, so I'm gonna start off with a, a fiscal summary of, of our stormwater and uh, component. Um, our, we, we try to have, or we'll, we're guided by the budget office and finance office to have a balanced budget. Um, when we present our budget, like Wayne said, in a few months, uh, he's going to present it for your recommendations next month. Um, we have to um, present a balanced budget. And how does that work? It works with our revenues, and we'll go deeper into um, each one of these um, components. But it works as our revenue equals our operating costs, um, our expenses, our operating costs, personnel, things of that nature, plus our CIP transfer. And I'll go a little bit into our CIP transfer um, later in, in the presentation. But I just wanted to give a, a big picture overview um, and we'll dive deeper into these sections and these numbers. And just as a basis, we're using fiscal 23 adopted budget. Um, you know, so it's easier to understand the figures that uh, you're seeing and the components that make up the, the fiscal. So we'll start off with revenue. Um, like Wayne mentioned, our revenue, majority of our revenue um, comes from our stormwater utility fee. The way it's collected, Wayne just went into some details for that. The majority, majority of that comes from our commercial, and uh, the rest of it's from our residential. That's collected on a monthly basis, um, and it's part of the water bill, um, which you know makes it a little bit easier for us um, as a division, uh, thanks to, to water and everybody else who's on that bill. Um, and then, like you mentioned, the way that's calculated is the rate, depending on which tier you fall on, or if you're commercial or over. Um, certain the, the last tier, which is tier five, um, and then that's the rates multiplied by um, however many units we have uh, throughout the city, and we're approaching almost four hundred thousand uh, units uh, within a city of Raleigh. Uh, secondary sources of revenues um, are our permit review and penalty fees. Um, this is 
closely related to Ben's team. Um, the, the plan uh, permits for the developments, uh, the review of those plans, um, those those fees um, make up a really small portion, but they do make up a portion of our revenues. Um, I would say our stormwater utility fee makes up almost 95% of our uh, revenue for the stormwater division. And then lastly, uh, you'll see the, the interest on investments. Obviously, our whatever holdings we have, whatever we have in a bank is gaining some interest, very moderate, safe, conservative interest. But at the same time, it is an income, it is a stream of revenue that we received. Um, very minimal, maybe a percent um, or less uh, in, in, in that aspect. Now we'll go over to, to our operating costs, our expenses. Um, and as you can see there, uh, approximately 22.8 million uh, in this current fiscal year that we're in, like when you mentioned July to end of June is our fiscal year. Uh, in, in our operating costs, um, I'm just giving you, a, it's obviously taking care of um, our personnel, that's our salaries, that's our benefits, and also our operating. So your normal day-to-day a cost to, to operate to conduct business. Though Wayne might have mentioned it in the organization chart, but we're made out of uh, our 138 uh, full time staff members are made up of two come from two different uh, I guess program. Um, you can say departments. Um, one is stormwater, which is our operation, and then the other one is stormwater uh, maintenance, which is where we are right now, uh, transportation field services. Uh, this is the breakdown of what the operating cost um, is between the two uh, departments, I guess you can say divisions. 67 for stormwater and 33% for, um, for stormwater maintenance. Uh, in addition to those, those are obviously the higher uh, expenses operating costs that we have in stormwater, followed by indirects and general fund transfers. Um, indirects is um, what we pay out to different departments in the city. For their services, big ticket items there are IT. Well, we pay our IT department for um, everything they do for us, and as well as development services. Um, in, in addition to bringing in the revenues from the plans and, and permits and review fees, um, they handle a lot of as a lot of the aspects of that operation, development service team. Uh, so those are two big components when it comes to indirect, and then our general fund transfers. Those are funds um, give you an idea. We're paying for um, a big transfer. There is our collections of the revenue. Uh, we pay um, a department in, in the city. It's called uh, CCMB, uh, which stands for? Sure, Mark Aaron Billing. There you go. Um, sorry about that. And, and so we pay a big percentage to them um, in our uh, general fund transfers um, for, for doing the, the collection of the funds. Obviously, like, I, like we mentioned, uh, stormwater, water, uh, solid waste, uh, and sort everybody's on it, and they charge all those three um, departments for their services. Uh, so that's a big one there. And then other than that, um, there's some other small components that we pay um, to other departments um, throughout the city in the form of transfer. And then lastly, uh, debt services. Um, we, we don't have that much debt in stormwater, which is, is a good thing. Uh, we have one um, a revolving fund uh, debt that we're paying off. It's very minimal. Um, still have a few years left on that one. But um, like Wayne mentioned, we're hoping that um, we might go down that avenue in the next few years. Uh, so right now, really good with, with debt. Anything that we owe is very minimal. And then here is, um, you might notice this, this is one of uh, our new collection charts. Um, I think we talked about that last meeting. Um, and I think that's going on right now throughout the city for the next month or two, probably. And, and uh, thanks to the team for, for all their effort there. Um, we'll briefly go into fund balance requirements. Um, this is also a big component of our, of our, our planning of, for fiscal. Um, this year, in fiscal year 23, there wasn't any transfers um, allocated to the fund balance. Um, our, our fund balance, we have an internal policy to have uh, a fund balance of at least 50% of our operating costs. Um, so if you go back to the slide, two slides before, or slide before, um, we were roughly at 22, 23, we try to have a balance of at least 50% of that operating cost. Um, I'm glad to say that we're over that, that percentage. That's why there's no allocations at the moment in the current fiscal year um, to replenish or to 
bring that balance up to that 50 percent uh, threshold. A um, little bit more about the fund balance. Um, you know, it, it's a it's a the determinant of days cash on hand. Um, if anything were to happen, um, you know, we would result. You know, we would go back to that uh, fund balance or to that balance. And and um, currently we're we're well over like 250 to days uh, of cash on hand. Um, if anything were to happen, and we're relying on um, those funds. Uh, and this is also um, a key component looking forward into the future for our debt financing. Um, as far as you know, what what kind of debt we can bring upon and what we have sitting in the bank. Almost look at it as like a savings account. Um, when you go purchase a home, they kind of want to know all the funds you know you, you might have uh, at your disposal for any particular reason. And then lastly, uh, the one I mentioned. Uh, you know, operations and transfers equals our uh, balances off to our revenue is our CIP transfer. And we'll go a little bit deeper into this one. And I know Barbara will obviously go a little bit deeper into that the process of, of determining where those funds go. Um, this current year is 11.4 million uh, fiscal year 23. Um, we call it pay go. It's pay as you go transfer to 470. Um, that's just a fun internal thing. Uh, just the way it works. Everything comes into one fund. Um, our expenses come out of that fund, and then we send a certain amount, in this case, 11.4, to our CIP. The reason we send it there is because that money um, stays there. It doesn't. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't fall to a fund balance at the end of the year. If you don't use it, you don't lose it, kind of thing. Like it stays there uh, year over year and keeps rolling into the next year as those projects, because the projects take multiple years. Um, you know, the balances are there for for that time frame. Uh, when we do set those transfers up, um, we the, the amount is allocated, but then it's also allocated by specific programs or projects. Um, programs can obviously um, I'll give you an example: uh, DA drainage assistance program. There'll be set funds set for that, and then there's also individual um, identified projects that will also receive um, their 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 budget uh, or their funds in, in a given year. And we'll go into more details in a few slides now. So now that I gave you uh, the summary and I gave you a quick breakdown on, on you know, the, the revenues, the operation, the fund balance, and the CIP, I'm just going to show some historicals. Uh, going back to that first number you saw, which is 34.2, um, and just, we just went through the 11.4 to, uh, to the CIP and the 22.8 million over to oper for operating costs. This is a historical over the last few years and what that looks like. As you can see, in, pre, in the last two previous uh, fiscal years, we had to um, allocate funds for our fund balance restoration. Um, we had some, we had to use some funds in 20 for some emergencies and to get back to our policy, um, we, we needed to designate uh, or allocate uh, a certain amount for our fund balance in a given year as part of our budget. Um, one other thing you're going to notice here, and we'll go, you'll see in a few slides now, uh, a big jump in revenues from 26.1 to 32.8. Um, if you remember, that was a year that um, we adopted a 1.5, um, uh, sorry, a dollar 50 increase to our rates. Um, it was at 550 and then went up to $7. So um, it was a, almost a 30% increase in, in, our, in our utility fee rate. So that's a big jump there. And then obviously um, from last year to this year, we'll go into a little bit now. Any questions? Sorry, I'm going too fast. I know it's numbers. Right? <laughs> right. Just a quick comparison, like I just said, um, between 23 and, and 22, um, last year we were at $7. We, we proposed um, and, and, were, and was adopted a 2.5% rate increase, which is 18 cents uh, to that seven, to that, to that uh, single unit um, fee that, that Wayne was talking about. Uh, so it went from seven dollars to seven dollars and eighteen cents. This is um, the difference that it generated as far as uh, our revenue goes from thirty two seven to thirty four one. And then here's the, the the year over year difference between what went into our CIP in twenty two and what went into our CIP in twenty three. Just a historical on the fees um, that we've touched on. Um, that big jump that I just noted from 21 to 22 was that 150. Um, that was that was adopted almost 30 percent increase. Obviously, last year was 18. And then a key note here is 
from the inception of the program from 04 to 16, there was no adjustments to the fee. Obviously, we had you know, just started ramping up. Um, I guess we weren't there yet to, to start increasing our fees um, because we were catching up as far as our service goes. Um, there was a, a single increase from, 20, from 16 to 17. Obviously, went another four years at that rate. And, and then in the last few years, we've seen uh, some increases. And you're going to see in the next slide how um, it might seem like a lot in the last few years, but it's almost kind of making up for those first 12, 13 years of no increase. And you're going to see how we compare the other uh, cities and, and capital cities um, throughout the Southwest. So like I mentioned, um, we've been doing catching up for the last few years as far as our fees, and still we're in the middle of the pack. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, in white, we're going to see North Carolina communities. Um, so, you know, our peers that, you know, we, we, um, we follow closely and in blue, you're going to see the Southeast capital cities with utilities. So we highlighted uh, Columbia, Austin, Tallahassee, Richmond, and Nashville. And then we went up a step further and kind of bordered, highlighted um, recent increases to their fees. So the ones that have the, the green outline around have, um, within the past year, um, have increased their utility fees. As you know, uh, Greenville, Charlotte, Tallahassee, Durham, and Wilmington all have increased their, their rates in the last in the last year, um, and we're still in, I would say middle of pack compared to um, some of our most important peers. Any questions on this one? All right, and just going another historical chart. Um, I hope I'm not boring you with uh, historical numbers, but um, here's the our CIP transfer um, for, for our, our CIP team, our CIP funds. Most recent year with the 11.4 number, as you see, there's a, um, if you recall, there was the, the 1.5, $1.50 increase from 21 to 22. And that's obviously um, shown here um, in what we were able to transfer over to our CIP uh, in fiscal year 22. Um, a little history here, what, what possibly was happening here, I joined the team two years ago. Katie, congratulations on serving two years. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what I can what I can tell you what happened here was um, our fee was not was not um, there's no adjustments to our fees during these years as we continue to grow as an operation. So as we continue to grow our operating side um, and maintaining and operating the personnel, um, obviously the distribution to our CIP you know, was being affected little by little. And also, um, you gotta remember those um, those years that we allocated funds to our fund balance, um, that also painted a picture for this 6.5 in fiscal year 21. Then we got the, we received, um, you know, approval for that 1.5 increase from 21 to 22. And there you can now start seeing uh, a ramp up of our, of our CIP transfer. And, you know, happy to say that um, this current year that we're in, um, it's the most we've ever we were we have ever been able to uh, transfer uh, to our CIP projects our CIP fund, uh, which is that eleven point four number. Right, and how do we come up with all those numbers? Um, this I, when I started, um, this was um, dropped off on my desk uh, the first day, uh, which was uh, this very complex, sophisticated rate model, which I you know I really appreciate. Um, Wayne, Scott, and the whole team um, that was working uh, behind the scenes to get that going. Uh, before this, we had an internal model. Um, it, it, it worked well. Um, it's very, very simple uh, to the point, um, which you know worked for, for a good time. Um, and then uh, the the division and the department, with their support, you know, saw the, the need for a more sophisticated, accreditable uh, rate model. Um, our, our peers at Raleigh Water use the same organization, uh, the same style of rate model. Um, we worked with about to to, um, to get the model up and running. And like I said, two years ago, it was handed to me on the first day, and um, I've been making it sing. Is that what it was? I've been making it <laughs> sing uh, for, for a few years now. We've used the rate model uh, this year. Uh, we're using it for this year's uh, budgeting for 24, and we used it last year for this year's budgeting. And, um, 
pretty spot on. Um, it, it, it's it's functionality. Um, it's pretty impressive. Um, but obviously, you know, we had to provide the, the correct information. So we use the model to project revenues, expenses, and, and financial metrics over time. Um, it, it helps us predict into the future, not only the year that we're going into, but anything after that as well. We like to look at, and Smart Barb is going to talk about that now. We like to look at our CIP five years and also in 10 years, and then also know what's going on um, after that, uh, our out years. Um, so this helps us a lot. Uh, expenses, the same thing. We can highlight any expenses that we foresee coming up. We can you know, put that into the model down the line. Um, if it's personnel, if it's operating, if it's um, vehicles for stormwater maintenance, whatever it might be, we can plug those in and, and uh, it'll give us a, a clear picture of what to expect um, in the future. It, um, it, it helps to support our service options. Um, as you see here, there's different levels of rate increases. Um, you know, we can plug in um, different percentages that we want to perhaps um, look into what that would look like in the future if we were to incorporate um, a 2.5% increase or a 5% increase or for whatever reason, for whatever needs we might have coming down the line. And then um, it also allows for, like I mentioned, long-term planning scenario um, analyzes, including uh, funding options for CIP. So it, apart from our CIP transfers, what we receive from revenue, it also lets us plug in um, other sources of revenue that we might be exploring, which we'll talk a little bit more now. Um, grants are a perfect example of that. We've been working with our CADIS, I believe they presented to you guys a few, uh, a few meetings ago. And also um, debt financing that we haven't done much of um, to date, but it's something that um, we have set ourselves up with this model along with the team and the, prep, the preparing on the CIP side um, to, to explore that uh, for some priority projects and some also um, some known stormwater projects. I think that's the word we want to use, um, known stormwater projects that, um, you know, it, it's going to take us a while to, to get to, but that's going to help us. And like I said, Barb is going to dig deeper into that. And I think this is the transition into that known stormwater capital improvement needs um, that I just mentioned. So. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, any any questions? Yeah. Any questions? No, 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 so we have a question here. Yeah. Oh yeah, I uh, if you don't mind going back yeah. two slides. Sure. I apologize. The um I appreciate all the historical context on this one. It just seems like we're just looking at 2017 to 2022, 2023, and finally kind of getting back up to kind of the funding level that you were at quite a few years ago. Yes. Um and you may not maybe join the question, I suppose. Um Knowing that potentially in 2023, 11.4 might not carry the same as it did um, in 2017. I guess, how does that really impact the kind of projects you're able to fund? And kind of, do you see a discrepancy there on, on the level of projects you're able to fund with that amount? You know, is there kind of a, um, you know, just inflation considerations? That's a perfect question for Barbara. <laughs> okay, <I'll transition>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we understand the escalation. Yeah, and Barbara can touch a little bit more on that. But, um, it, it, it does hinder, obviously, but we also have to celebrate. It's the most, you know, we've been able to transfer it to the CIP. You need to knock down that one. Yes. No, yeah, yeah. We, that's its highlight. It's the, the most, but, you know, and, and that's thanks to the good work of, you know, the committee, uh, Wayne and his leadership, the department, and also, um, you know, the manager's office and the council in, in allowing us to start ramping up after, I, I believe, started in 21. We got 50 cents, then $1.15, 22, and then. Uh, for this year's 18 cents. So, you know, I think that's helping us because if we, we didn't get that help, we would still be uh, pretty little down there. So, uh, but yeah, Barbara can touch more on that. But yeah, obviously, um, you know, that factors in, you know, you can't do as much with 11.4, you know, compared to what you could have done with 10.9. Is that 70, uh, six, seven years ago? So we understand that. But um, we're trending in the right direction. So definitely. If I could, one more quick comment yep. related to Javier's. So, the revenue grows because of the rate increase. It also grows because we are still growing as a city, and the impervious area goes up as development occurs. So, those are the two factors that increase the the, the revenues from the solar utility fee, and that's all built into the rate model too. Correct those assumptions. Yeah. So the 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 not only does the fee or the rate increase. But the units also increase as well. It's a very moderate increase, but it is a say a percentage or so uh, per year, and and that's what we kind of 
we don't predict that kind of growth into the future, but that's what we've been seeing uh, in the last few years. That's, that was my question. Yeah, 17 and 20. I mean, you said something like 400,000 units, right? So were we 380,000 units before? Or like, what's that kind of road? Like well, I said, 1%, 1%, 1.5 on a good year. Obviously, the last few years have seen a little bit more growth with development. Um, so you can attribute to that. Um, okay. in the last few years. And also, sorry to interrupt. Um, and then also, when it comes to the plan review and fees, like you, you, we've seen a, grow, a growth in the last few years um, because of obviously the growth in, in, in Raleigh. I'm assuming it, it seems like it's been growing, but the numbers show that. So, strange question on that. Say there's a $1,000 fee paid at Belmont Services. How much does, and how much do you, how much does, how much comes back to this department? So, first for the plan review, yeah, yeah, for plan review. Yeah, so how that works, like the process fees don't, we're not really a part of process fee, they didn't have our indirect fees, but we get our specific permit fees. Back. Okay. Everything from stormwater permit, or permit, or, uh, or a land use permit, those fees come directly to stormwater. Kind of at the end of the system, when you pay all those in, in indirect fees. Yeah, that's what comes to you. Okay. Yeah. And um, with wine and sell, we're taking a look at uh, revamping the fee system because that is that fee system is about uh, 20 years old. <laughs> so, as far as how that works, so we're looking to kind of upgrade those fees and kind of pick a few more proactive and use those. And we don't get anything from the investment side here, except for rear VP, which don't be charged a lot. Yeah, traditionally, probably any of them stuff, you're not just small, strong workers reference. Yeah, so, so we generate, you know, a good amount of fees from, from Ben's team, but it's it's not where we would want to be, um, especially if that's being charged to the developers um, and, and anything new comes into the city. Um, and then going back to, to your statement, you know, we receive everything up front, but we do have the indirect costs. And I mentioned development services, that's where they take their portion. Okay. I'll have to go deeper into exact percentage that it ends up being. Yeah. The good thing is it's two years in the in the past. We we pay two years into the future just because um, we wait for the year to finish, then they work on the allocation, and then we pay it in the next budget. So the year that just ended, we're actually budgeting that expense in 24. Thank you. Yeah, that goes back to what we said, if these funds are adequate or not, Barbara did tell us the way to tell us, so we've already fixed all the problems. So we... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. What is mentioned in that search? <laughs> so, so, Wayne talked a little bit about the fee structure and how revenue comes in, and Javier talked about how does that divide up into operating capital. Um, and this next part of the presentation is going to touch on well, how do you decide what to put into your capital plan? How do you decide what's a priority? And so just kind of start in big picture. Um, we know from past studies uh, that we have about $850 million of stormwater opportunities. So that's a lot. Um, we have major CIP projects, water quality, aging infrastructure, flood mitigation um, out there that, that we could we could we could implement. And if we look um, using our current pay as you go strategy um, and looking at what our pay as you go number was in FY23, that would take about 75 years to deliver those projects. So we are looking at an ongoing debt financing strategy and grant strategy so that we could reduce that delivery down to four years as an example. So the next couple of slides are going to touch a little bit on that grant strategy and then the debt financing strategy. Okay, so stormwater is, um, as Javier mentioned, pursuing grants um, more aggressively now. And this is an overview of the grants that we were um, awarded this fiscal year or are pursuing. So I want to give kudos to the stormwater staff who worked on these pursuits. Uh, we were awarded 4.3 million dollars in grants in FY23, with 3 million of that coming from the City of Raleigh BARPA funding. Um, we've applied for another 5.5 million dollars. So, largest of that um, is for the Rose Lane drainage project. We applied for state BARPA funding. And we'll touch on that Rose Lane project a little bit later on. Um, and then we're preparing another 250 thousand dollars in grants. So, with these grants, we can implement some of these bigger projects that otherwise would have taken a while to get done. 
So that's one half of the strategy. The other part is debt financing. And this slide looks at the impact of debt financing on what we can implement in a five or CIB. So on the left, we have the five, the pie chart. If we don't do debt financing, we can implement about $70 million worth of work. But if we start looking at debt financing, we can implement $90 million worth of work in that same five year period. So Wayne's going to talk a little bit more about this next month. Um, but this is a strategy that we have been working on grants and debt financing. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about how we set priorities in the CIP. We know we have a lot of needs out there. Um, so every year we sit down with the program areas, we review all the priorities and, and generate a, the top list. And the things that we look at, there's a lot of factors, but uh, the three big ones are the integrated project prioritization model. So each project is ranked with the prioritization model that considers public safety, flooding benefits, water quality benefits, and receives a score. So the higher priority projects are put into the CIP. Uh, the other factor we consider is coordination with other departments. So we have the stormwater smart uh, work work better with others, collaborate with other departments. So an example of this, um, a lot of times our SEM retrofit opportunities are done in coordination with a parks improvement project. So there's, so we coordinate with the parks department. Another example is our asset management group um, is now working more with early water and roadways so we can coordinate that work together. And so that impacts what is put into the CIP. Um, the last bullet is a grant requirement. So if we have a grant out there, um, sometimes requirements of when the money needs to be spent, and that impacts the basing in the CIP. And this table shows the program categories and funding for FY23. And next month we'll talk about um, the same categories and funding for FY24. All right. So I did want to touch a little bit on the equity related data sets that we wanted to incorporate into the prioritization model. And Wayne touched on this um, back in the May presentation to SMAP. So we are looking at incorporating equity into our prioritization model. And there are three um, ongoing efforts that we think will help, um, help with that regard. So the first, uh, Stormwater has a consultant supported project to operationalize equity. So looking at how to incorporate equity into a lot of different program areas, including, including capital planning. Um, also, the um, Department of Equity Inclusion and City IT are developing a geospatial equity index later that they are going to provide to other departments. So this may be another way we can incorporate equity into our prioritization model. And then lastly, there is an ongoing city strategic plan initiative to, to develop an environmental justice mapping tool. Um, so with these three things, uh, we anticipate another update to SMAP um, to talk more about the prioritization model and how we're incorporating equity. Okay, so these next slides talk about the projects that we are proposing for debt financing. So we have the list of projects on the left, uh, Rose Lane, Camp Pond, Whispering Branch, Battleford, Smoky Hollow. And then we have slides on each one that we can go over quickly. Um, but this slide shows uh, the, the phases of the project from planning in green all the way out to construction in red. And you can see that these are high dollar projects. We couldn't easily fit these into our CIP. Uh, the Rose Lane project itself would be as much as our entire CIP, and they're all headed for construction in FY25 to 26. So because of this, we're looking at debt financing so that we can get these projects done on the schedule and don't have to push them back. All right, so the next set of slides are going to go over um, the different projects. You might have heard about Rose Lane. Uh, this project is in Southeast Raleigh. Um, Rose Lane and Overtops, Walnut Creek Overtops. This road one to two times per year and kind of it cuts off access to a 55 um, home neighborhood. So it's a one way in, one way out street. And this is the project to address it. Next is Camp Pond Dam. 
Um, this dam is under notice of deficiency by dam safety. Uh, there's a city road over the dam, which is also sole access for approximately 40 homes. And the primary spillway, which is that um, corrugated metal pipe that's shown here, is severely corroded. And if we don't address this, the, the dam will erode. So this is another high priority project for us. Next, Battleford and Whispering Branch. Uh, these projects are in airspace um, to address street and house flooding. Uh, you'll, Whispering Branch and Woodell are both one way in, one way out streets. And so when they overtop, people cannot get to their home. So uh, another high priority project for us. And then lastly, Smoky Hollow Park. Uh, these improvements will restore Pigeon House Branch. This is a park downtown. The current site is off the left. Um, this project involves screen daylighting and installing GSI. Any questions on the projects? All right, so I hope this provided an overview of the rate, uh, the, the revenues, how things work in, in the fiscal world, and uh, how we prioritize things in the CIP. Um, we're working on that grant and uh, debt financing strategy to accelerate the delivery of these high priority projects, and more to come next month. I see a quick question, and this will be in the next next month session, so feel free to give me a follow there. But quickly, those the tool that you use for the prioritization piece, I'm um, really excited that you can have a systematic way to, to look over all those elements and kind of having uniform apples to apples. Some um, when Clearly, when you see a picture, it's kind of moving to say yes, funded. But um, uh, looking at those pieces, are those for each one of those um, floodway? You know, each one of those categories they're using to kind of develop that project benefit score. Um, are those equally weighted? Are there ones you revisit that criteria weighting every year, or how is that um, done? That's, that's a really good question. Um, the so there are. Nine different categories in the prioritization model. Should I correct me if I'm getting that wrong? Nine different categories. Each category has a weight, which right. was developed by SMAC a number of years ago. Uh, we have been thinking it's time to look at that weighting criteria in the model um, and make sure we're, you know, it's, it's working for us still. So we probably will bring that back to SMAC for your mind. I just think, think about that on the, on the different side quite a bit. So I think, you know, sometimes there's projects that are needed, but there's not really a criteria to fit it. So sometimes something that is getting dropped to the bottom, even though it's going to be here. So just interested in the process. Appreciate that. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, the question you asked previously that I deferred, did we answer that with Barbara's part of the presentation? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Question. Sorry. What's the. Uh, Grant funding strategy for the projects you the five projects. The five projects. That, what's the potential for grant funding there? I mean it's, it's a five year thing out, but there's a lot of grant funding in the for water stuff. Yeah, and, and that's a that's a good question. We, we are working with our cadets if they if you presented a few months back. Um and, and we've identified potential um opportunity grants out there that you mentioned a lot of grant money out there. Um, and tied those to our priority projects, with our, which are those five that are down the pipeline. Um, it, it's just a matter of getting a little bit closer. Um, we have them, I guess, identified. Um, we just gotta wait for the proper time to actually apply for them, and then we can go a little bit deeper into that. But yeah, yeah, we are considering this. Yeah, and, and just a little more specific. So um, Rose Lane was one of the projects that we did get $800,000 for the design of that project from the city's ARPA allocation. Right. And the state um, ARPA, we applied for 5 million, which was the most we could apply for under the state ARPA program. We're waiting to hear. We do expect to hear back this month on whether we would get 5 million or some other um, amounts um, from, from that. So but those are the, those are the biggest ones. Smoky Hollow, we talked about applying to land and water um, for that project. I think it's a good fit, um, but we think we're a year out. That I think that application was due in February, February today or yesterday. I mean, we, we talked about maybe two months ago applying for that one. We didn't think we were far enough along in that one yet, so we're likely going to apply for that one a year a year from now. 
Um, I don't think we've talked about any of the others in that specific, but there are some others that are on the target for, for grant funding. Be millions of dollars. It, yeah, no, we I think there are you're, yeah. you're exactly right. There's a lot of opportunities and we continue to work with Arcata. So I think you heard a presentation from maybe six months ago about kind of the grants. They continue to be um, under contract with us to help us look ahead, especially the FEMA and the brick and some of those other opportunities to to match our projects with the scoring for those for those funding and, and, and try to, to see what what's the best fit moving forward. Yes, going back to our kids, we meet with them monthly and even in between those meetings, if anything comes up, we're you know continuing discussions on um, the opportunities that are presented and, and you know which of our projects to identify uh, would be a good fit. But definitely um, those big ticket projects grant funding would be very good in addition to the debt financing strategy. Thanks. Question back to your presentation, the work chart and these five projects kind of being a bubble in the pipeline, potentially, but a good thing. Are there any staff correlations between additional staff or needs for staff that are different than kind of how the frame is it? And does all this model work yeah. with all of that? Yes, yeah, I, I can talk a little bit on that. Um, the, the, the current plan we're doing for 24 is, is essential for getting to year 25 and, and beyond uh, for those big ticket projects. Uh, as part of that, you might see that next month, um, Wayne's presentation. On what we have as far as the strategic needs um, when it comes to positions uh, to make sure we're, we're lined up correctly for those five big projects in, in a few years, since it'll all be happening around the same time. Um, so, yeah, we are looking to increase. Obviously, that's an operational cost, uh, will affect you know, our distribution, I guess, our contribution to our CIP, but everything is, is, um, is factored in. And I don't know, we wanted to touch a little more or just wait for. For next month, you'll see, see some of that. Yeah, I'll touch on it briefly. So, um, you know, what we're forecasting and looking at is a big ramp up in our CIP um, program, right? That's going to go up, you know, by FY27 or eight, maybe maybe double what, what we are in terms of the annual CIP deliveries. So we really look closely at our CIP project management group. That's that group is. We have we had reorganized it a couple of years ago, anticipating this. That group is fairly staffed. One of the reclassifications that we just got approved that is still vacant is another project manager in the drainage assistance group. Um, right now, the CIP group has been helping us with the drainage assistance, so that will add capacity there. In a preview for next month, we're proposing two additional project manager positions in that CIP for our FY24 budget. And then looking ahead to FY25, we're anticipating proposing two more inspectors. It would um, correspond to the onset of the construction starting up for those CIP projects. So, very much important to look at that capacity and, and, and how we can deliver as we ramp up those, especially the CIP. So, yeah, good question. And I guess the last question would be is there, we're at $7.18 per unit now, and, and we're talking about debt financing and some other things. Are we also going to see a request? We don't know yet. Or just Seven dollars and thirty-two cents next year, or something like that. You have, have, to, have to wait. Okay. <laughs> How exciting is this? <laughs> so I, I will say we are we are discussing an option. Yeah, we're discussing an option for a rate increase. We have a meeting with the city manager's office to make sure they and budget and finance and everybody, you know, are are on are on board. But we will have met with them by the time we come back to you, and we'll we'll have that proposal nailed nailed down. Yeah, and, and you'll yeah. be able to weigh into it before it goes to council. Okay. And, and just um, to continue on on Wayne's comment, um, you got to remember when, if we do recommend an increase or or, or ask for an increase, um, others other divisions, other departments might be doing the same, yeah. and right. we all we all end up on the same bill on a monthly bill. You just get home, so it's something that. We get to the manager's office, everybody you know discusses, and then obviously they have a bigger picture of you know what would be a good way to approach the council. Thank you, Captain. Yeah, thank you. sorry. And, and didn't the budget have a 2.5% increase assumption for the next three or four years to get through this CFP? Yeah, so so you know, as a as a base, we have gone with a 2.5. Yeah. Um, it's something we 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 gathered from our peers at, at Raleigh Water that they have a continuous um, mm -hmm. increase uh, to their rate, very consistent. 
um, and nothing too drastic. Um, now that we're at a good point, right? Now that we're at that almost middle of the, the range right. when it comes to the feed throughout the southeast. But yes, next up, uh, we spotted that. That fine print. Any other questions? You guys, your presentation very, very helpful. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Shaz, I think you're up talking about drainage assistance and stream stabilization. I'm going to make it work. Even that one. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Chad Bunn, nice to see y'all again. So this is the drainage assistance uh, program project review, but you know, as I'm sure if you, you've seen on your agenda that we will have the stream stabilization projects coming up next. So an overview of the presentation, um, while well, drainage assistance is still more of a project overview, we'll look at the pending projects, and we'll look at the project requests, then the funding overview, and then recommendations and questions. So the stormwater management core division mission. Um, I know it's been talked about we we talked about this, um, but to support healthy natural resources, complement sustainable growth within the raw community and the drainage systems program always looks to promote that and support that. So I know most of most of this commission was pretty familiar with this, but just to go over it again. In order to qualify for the drainage assistance, you must own property within the city limits. Have stormwater runoff on the public's uh, property or street. Be willing to donate a drainage easements, and we do not cover nuisance flooding or lot to lot drainage. So we have uh, 1.25 million in annual funding that is allotted. That doesn't mean those funds will be spent this fiscal year. Oftentimes, they're spent in future fiscal years. We try to be efficient but at the same time diligent. Uh, we with that we'll fund about eight projects per year, and funding is based on the prioritization and, or the ranking within the prioritization model. Okay, so uh, we have pending projects, and normally under in past presentations, we've taken the top two on the list or top three, depending on how many projects we have. Uh, but now with the creation of the stream stabilization program. We have some options. So, not every uh, drainage systems project is a stream stabilization project, but every stream stabilization project does qualify for drainage assistance. So, under this current program or we'll, our, our current setup, is we're going to look at the drain or the stream stabilization projects and determine whether they qualify first under stream stabilization or drainage assistance. And in this case, Simmons Branch Trail. Uh, qualified first, and that opened Verdugo, or excuse me, Simmons Ranch Trail qualified first in the stream stabilization, which opened up Verdugo and Somerton Drive uh, for drainage assistance, and then we'll take for for sure court for stream stabilization. So just to kind of give you an overview, if you're looking like why do we take number two and three, and why is one and five going for stream stabilization? Any questions about that? Because I know that's that's a little bit different. Um, so we have two projects. First one will be Verdugo Drive, south end of town, south end of the city, and then we have Summerton Drive on the north end of, of the city. So we have 3129 North, 3133 South uh, Verdugo Drive. Um, you can see that there's a pipe that bisects the two properties. It runs a little bit more than halfway, half of the property line. Um, He's, he's built this plow was done in 1983 with the building was built in 1995. Uh, drainage basin will be a little bit uh, zoomed out look. Drainage basin is about six acres of so uh, a big drainage basin, but still one that does contribute. So with Verdugo Drive, uh, we have a sinkhole uh, about eight feet from the property in the north, about 16 feet from the property in the south. Um, the picture on the left is is that sinkhole? Um, this is the outlet of the pipe. You can see there's some sediment within the pipe. 
not exactly uh, a deep cut, but certainly uh, with with the sinkhole, it's, it's concerned. Picture on the left, just a little bit more zoomed out. You can see the proximity of the house that's the house on the north side. Uh, then here's a video. See sediment buildup in the bottom of the pipe, the hole. So we're looking at downstream, so the house would be to the left. And uh, that's why we feel like lining this pipe would not be an option. So we would go in and replace this pipe and uh, install some dissipating to dissipate the flow as it comes out. Uh, so again, replace 80 or linear feet uh, with the 18 inch RCP. Include some outlet protection, uh, current pipe is concrete, and just just so we're all clear, uh, the green line is sewer, uh, blue line that runs in the street is water. This is a drainage path, path, pathway. Uh, I made my line orange this time, unlike blue in December, so we can differentiate. So thank you all for that, that feedback. Uh, and that's approximate, the approximate location uh, of the sample. It becomes open channel at the end of the arrow at the end of your arrow there. Yeah, that's open channel. That's open channel. Open channel type of property line. Yes, right there. Okay. So one of the things we're doing is we are looking at scoring, making sure we're consistent when we score. Uh, give credit to our, our staff because they do an excellent job. Um, I'm looking at these and reviewing these and scoring this as well. I'm, I'm noticing a lot of consistency. So we, we had Bayfield, which was a sinkhole, which is a little bit further uh, from, from the, the, the home that we were looking at a few months ago. Um, so Verdugo is going to, to have a higher public health and safety uh, scoring because it is closer. Uh, you can see the factors uh, generally, quite quite similar. I think this gives credit to how consistent we are with our scoring model. So, you know, to the those who did work on the scoring model, thank you. This is this, this helps us be consistent. Uh, so, safety clearly Cali score eighty uh, for eight and sixty for six. You can say Michigan Cali score close, but again, Michigan Cali score takes into account um, the fog. Uh, health and safety quite a bit. So that's why those numbers are uh, just a little bit. Uh, total progress score 35, 30.52 for Verdugo, 27.14 for Bayfield. Verdugo cost. Again, we are using the method of taking Western Northridge bid projects and assigning um, values based off estimates. Again, these are purely estimates. Uh, but assigning those those contractor values, uh, assigning engineering costs, looking at a 30% contingency. And so with that, we have a total of $109,000 uh, with engineering costs at about $11,000. So with that, I'll pause for questions. If you wanted to vote now or you know, wait, yeah, I don't know. I, mean, um, I guess we approve or deny the project. So yeah, for approval of the project. Second? Second. Any conversation? Oh, all in favor? No opposition. Thank you. We did vote this point. Yeah. Yeah. I do have a question. Yes. This is not related to this, but we met the guys here in this building. They do all a lot of work. At what point do they? Not get called in, or is it because this is on private property? The scale up is too big. I'm just trying to figure out how what where these guys work. Yes, yeah, so we, we try to be mindful that they are busy, right? And especially like you'll see on this next project, it was leaf season, so we we don't call them in unless we absolutely have to. Okay. Um, but in this case, with a sinkhole, and we could kind of see the outlet of the pipe. We wanted to get a video of the pipe. So they came and did that. But I'm just don't think they're talking about construction. Yeah, construction side. Yeah, just curious as to. Yeah, it is. It, it, it comes down to a resource limitation. There are some okay. projects they can they can do, um, but it really comes down to a, a resource limitation that they have a backlog of projects that um, kind of maximizes their ability to deliver. Now that is a strategy, that, and, and I think um, when Dan Clinton and Jason Moon gave their presentation on that. Yeah. Construction, we're looking to expand that capacity. 
Um, yeah, you know, and, and, and we would like to do that because it's, it's quicker. We don't have to bid it. We don't have to worry about change or all the advantages of that that, that Dan and Jason talked about. The, the difficult part is hiring the training. All our staff here are more maintenance focused, which is very different than construction focused. It's a different skill set. So, in order to expand that capacity, we would have to add another crew and hire more people and train more people. So, we want to go in that direction, but it's not something we can do quickly. Yeah, I guess in, in the scale and size and the scope of this looks like so, like in five years, the city may be saying, Yeah, we got we got this. We'd like to be like absolutely. Right. Thank you. All right, next we have uh, 1071, uh, which is on the south. Uh, Summerton Drive and 1079 on the north uh, property there, uh, just above the red box. Uh, this was recorded in 1998 and built in 2000 and 1999. So, uh, zooming out what this strange basin um, is about uh, 21 acres, and I'm going to get to later on here why that is important, why that's significant, but a little bit larger drainage basin uh, than the project we saw before. So um, this was a picture captured by the red line of, of 1079. Um, this is, you can see there's quite a bit of flooding between 1079 and 1071, which you can't see is the flooding getting behind the house, getting into the house. So that's why this is qualified here for, for review. Um, part of the issue that's going on is we believe there is an undersized pipe. There's also a lot of debris um, that has caused a blockage within that undersized pipe. Uh, so this this fence, this is looking at the edge of a 32 inch pipe, which I'll get into in just a minute. Uh, this picture is looking from the property between 10, 10 and 7, 21 and 10, 7, 29. And um, looking to the northwest, um, it, there's not much of a channel way. There's a lot of overland flow that is getting caused in this way. So, what we would uh, like to do is we would like to upsize the 30 inch pipe to a 42 inch pipe. Uh, it's a little bit tough to see, but this pipe that runs to the road, that is a 42 inch pipe. There's not much of a ditch there. So that's causing a lot of overland flood to flood these properties, flood these structures. And so what we'd like to do is upsize the, the 30 inch to a 42 inch, uh, install a guard to protect some of the debris, and as well as to find that ditch path a little bit more so we can get more of that water into the pipes. So um, just rough calculations in the using uh, rational. If you were to take a look at that 30 inch, 30 inch pipe, full flow, we're, we're looking at about uh, 50 CFS, but if we're using the storm water design manual values, you're having about 79 CFS for the 10 year storm and 90 CFS for uh, the 25 year storm. And if we uh, upgrade it to a 42 inch pipe, we can get about 122 uh, CFS capacity, and that's assuming uh, C value 0.5 and pipes up at 1.5 or something. So, uh, Birchwood, uh, this was a project that came in, uh, excuse me, Summerton, but I'm comparing it to Birchwood. Birchwood came in, had some flooding between some properties. This was January of last year. Uh, you can see again scores all are, are fairly similar uh, so it, it lends itself to the fact that our scoring is is consistent and um, we, we feel very good about the scoring so summerton costs again same uh same setup and same contractors as the previous project contractor a b c d uh, not a, a big project so um ninety thousand uh, total cost with engineering of that uh, 20,000. Question on that one. Yes. For contractor G, the construction cost of engineering is likely like, you know, inside and all that is relative, right, to construction. 
piece. Why is that one so much lower? Do I have to do that's a it's like a pop quiz question. Sorry, but no, it's okay. It's okay. Why is why is contractor B? Yeah, that construction. Yeah, yeah, construction. Really yeah. I mean, that's thirty thousand difference in construction. Um, so what does that to do with? So a lot of this, there's some basic costs that go into this, like mobilization, right? Um, you know, uh, engineering design and, and documentation. So as I recall specifically, if it's a, the spreadsheet was quite long. Yeah, yeah, fair. Um, there. Their pipe size uh, wasn't as much, so they weren't putting as much on the pipe sleeve because it's such Got pipe it. is not a huge or a bigger percentage of the project cost. That's what we're seeing. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, there's a bond. Is it on um, one of the maps? Is that behind this property or the next property over? And then is that affecting? Is that a pool? That's a pool. That's a Burbies. So any more any more questions? I think that the concern Nicola has is just, is ninety the right number? If you have such a low is it's the fifty seven skewing your your expectations there. It's ninety enough to cover it, right? If everyone yeah. else is I'm not gonna like overly proof. <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> I'm just saying it's if, good. if you're approving a project and one is so low, it just seems like it might be getting skewed. You have to pick one of those contractors, right? Well, these were previous con this was a previous bit. So this is just trying to get an average of that. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're using the way to measure this new estimate. But, right. Yeah. Do you ever look at the hundred year flood event in sizing that pipe? I just because I've had to deal with some of that stuff. So we, we took the policy. Remember, we re revised the drainage system policy a couple months ago, and it says to meet or exceed city standards when practical. So yeah. we wouldn't ask the developer to necessarily size it for the hundred years. So we wouldn't ask ourselves to size it for the hundred years. <laughs> How big would it have to be for a linear buffer? I mean, how much? It, how much bigger is the hundred? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think you would. You're talking about probably twenty five percent more flows. What I recall, the CI is going to change. The other values are going to be constant. Just. Go back to how we get into situations. I'm curious as to whether or not that pipe was part of subdivision or whether that was installed by the builders or the home builders at the time, you know, because it's obviously undersized. And I hate to think that maybe I approved that or something. So, you know, if we looked at the construction plan to see how that pipe got to be undersized, we look pretty good back. This very recent subdivision should have caught that. We did look, I did look at the the de excuse me, the development plans uh, to what I could find, and I didn't see where that pipe was part of it. But I'm not saying it wasn't approved. But I don't think I think they just went in. If you look at it and you, you were on site, you would see it was kind of put together. And it's like kind of last minute work. I'm not sure if it got approved. Yeah, that's one of my ongoing concerns. Is we're using city dollars to pay for. Something where somebody did an inadequate job in the first place, and I, that really gives me heartburn because they're going in the ground every day out there because we don't permit a lot of that stuff. Once they build the houses, or even once they build the subdivision, the roads and stuff, we walk away and they can install a pipe anytime after it. And if they save a bunch of money by putting too small a pipe, when we come back and fix it for them, it's just not really kosher. It is that balance that we try. To find because um, some of these older projects that have, have gone back to the 70s, you could make the, the same case understanding that it is older. Um, but we've uh, we've we've approved those projects. Look at the front of the block. There's a piece of there. So that was something that was good. It's a chair. Yeah. Could I know what you're going to do? I think it's a chair. <laughs> 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 Mark, Mark did or didn't see his name on the <laughs> <laughs>
It's good. I was just noted to call it that these kinds of things give us heartburn. I give me heartburn just because I feel like we're going around fixing other people's mistakes and, you know, we're just chasing our tail and spending money and city money to do it sometimes. But I don't know if we have a choice. Anybody would like to make a motion? Motion to approve this. Motion to approve it by Terrell. Anyone would like to second that motion? I'll second. I'd like to take let's take a vote. All in favor of this spending ninety thousand dollars. Some of maybe. I'll put my hand up. One, two, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Two against, I believe. Yep. And Mark. Thank you, guys. But this is in the scope of what the suggestion. Yeah. Same with the other stuff, and I was on this position on another thing. It's like the programs to be qualified us for the program assistance, right? So if we wanted to consider, we would adjust the program parameters of the program. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I agree with that, but homework or right. 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 Yeah. The, the first picture the developer is long gone. Oh, yeah. The first picture was terrible. Yeah. 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 So we tell we tell the property owner when it rains, get out and take the photos, right? That makes the best case for you. I thought you were gonna stop and get out. I thought <laughs> at least you just get you out. don't tell the homeowners just to get out. <laughs> that's, that's good. So uh all right, Simmons Branch Trail, the I think it'll be our first stream stabilization project to review. Is that correct? Yeah. Haven't reviewed one of these before. It's 456, so try to speed these on. All right. I'm still Chow's Butt, and this is a stream stabilization program. These are our first two projects, and I want to thank you all for recommending this to council. Got approved in November, and now we are taking our first projects uh, to the uh, same agenda as before. It's going to be the same setup. Uh, again, same criteria in order to qualify, but differences now you you donate a conservation easement rather than a drainage easement. Um, Five hundred thousand dollars in annual funding. Um, that doesn't again means we'll spend in future years uh, likely, and we'll fund about five projects per year funding based on the breaking the prioritization model. So we have Verdugo and Summerton approved. So now Simmons Branch and uh, Birchford Court. Uh, they had the opportunity to get first based off uh, the subset and, and rising up under the under stream stabilization. So, uh, Birchford Fort, uh, a little bit to the east of uh, 440, and we're in north of 87, Simmons Ranch Trail, on the southwest side, 440 and 40. Um, so, Simmons Ranch Trail, excuse me, uh, 5100. To the north, 5034 highlighted in red. Uh, these buildings uh, were, were plotted in 1988 and uh, they were built in 1990. Uh, we're on one of the main stands here, so this is a fairly large uh, drainage basin. Um, so it's it's 230 acres. And um, so this picture is looking now south. You can see it's fairly close. Got a better picture on the next slide uh, that shows it's uh, encroaching. It's it's getting pretty close to the foundation. Uh, this picture is, is looking north and uh, not as close uh, to the foundation on that side, but certainly some erosion. And while we're out there, we can go in and, and stabilize it as well. Uh, this is a, a little better picture. Um, again, it gives you a better scope as to where the house is. Uh, this is looking to the west. It would be looking through that, that pipe that, that comes out and uh, daylight some of the stream. Uh, so we would, with the erosion approximately eight foot from the foundation, the house in the south, uh, we would armor it a little bit. Uh, we, we would want to use salt vegetation when we could, so we figure for the property in the north over here. We could do that. I, I do want to point something out. 
but there is a T. So if you notice that uh, this is this property right here that T's in is is a different property. It's owned by a commercial agency. Um, we don't have the permission. Yes, we will certainly try to connect it. Uh, otherwise, they would be uh, separate. Our our rationale was if we're there and we have erosion on that other side, that we can we can go in and, and fix it. Um, so Simmons Branch scoring, uh, we had a, a project Flipside Drive which had erosion. This came before the commission in November of 2021, and Flipside Drive was about uh, 25 feet from the foundation. Uh, you can see overall if the floor is lower. The main driver in all of this is the public health and safety, and that's uh, that's non because of the proximity to the, the structure. So here we're we're back with the same contractors. Um, we're estimating about one hundred fifty eight thousand uh, dollars and sixteen thousand dollars of engineering. Um, and I'll I'll go back because I didn't say that uh, we're going to look to be doing about one hundred thirty five linear feet of mapping and, and still the vegetation. So that's why that that cost is is like that. So I'll stop for questions. And this is you guys. Uh, just remind me, you guys haven't hired a consultant to kind of come up with exactly the locations of the Guar and the. Correct. Right. This is just to underwrite high levels we're looking at. It. That is a strange piece of property there. That one that tees through there. It is. Uh, hopefully, they would like to we, see their. Screen. We've reached out. We. We don't have a number for them on file. Uh, we we have some abilities and times to get numbers and, and call them, so we'll have to do letters or try to reach out to methods. Anybody have any questions? Someone? May I like to make a motion? Where in the other? We're at 39. It's a problem. Okay, you're kidding first. You're second. <laughs> all right. Um, all in favor of approval? Thank you. So our last project, our second one now for our stream stabilization is 2529 and 2533 uh, uh, first report the reported 1992 years built 1992 and 1993. Zoomed out look, this drainage basin to this point right here uh, is about 29 acres. It's on the stream side right there. Okay, yeah. so I've, I've got three pictures now. I usually have two, but thank you, Ariel, for your help in organizing. These look great. You did a much better job of organizing this than I did. Uh, so, picture on the left is looking up towards the house on the, on the southwest side. Uh, picture in the middle is looking at uh, a pipe that's a little bit clogged, a little bit blockage uh, there going on. And then, picture on the left. Right here is looking uh, downstream, and so you can see there's there's a roading getting within about uh, 15, 16 feet of the property. Got some concerns here. One of them, you know, line, not on that. See slow reduction there. Um, <laughs> open up that pipe a little bit, and um, do some slope stabilization uh, when we can. Uh, so we're looking maybe 20. Linear feet of brick wrap, 80 foot linear feet of edge chase. So, uh, looking to expose that block pipe because if that pipe is blocked, that water tends to gush out when it is eroding uh, some, of, some of that downstream area, right where that purple dot is. So, I compared it again to the same Brookside Drive. Uh, Brookside Drive was about 20 feet from the home. First for the 16 feet is public health and safety becomes now seven. So again, if you were to compare it to the previous uh, project, we'll see that as we get further away from the house, this public health and safety factor goes down. And again, that is consistent. And that is a main driver of the scoring system. So again, more credibility to, to our consistent scoring. Uh, most of these factors uh, all about the same. And total project score uh, ends up being 
be fairly close. So again, these these four contractors now, which I'm sure you've gotten quite used to seeing. And we we're going to anticipate about 114 thousand uh, dollars for total cost, 11 thousand for engineering. So I'll stop for questions. The uh, remaining DA funds. This. Oh, sorry. That should be yeah. civilization. And do you have a million troop civilization or is it or is it five hundred per year? You did two years combined. We have two years combined, yes. All right, so I make a motion. So move move for approval. Okay. Well, all right, all in favor. Approved. Thank you, Chad. And with stream stabilization, I mentioned to Wayne that I you guys maybe got an email. I got an email for some stream stabilization workshop um, that I think is coordinated through the Cooperative Extension and some folks at NC State. But there's an opportunity to go out and put the real estate and real life sticks in the ground and do some stuff here soon. So if you haven't got an email, reach out to Wayne. You guys want to get muddy, stabilize some creek. We did it tomorrow. Well, it was a couple of weeks ago. I guess uh, Don McSwall was out there working. Mitch Woodward is, Woodward is the guy that does the projects. It's, I mean, it's both educational, bring out a lot of contractors and, and citizens, and a number of people that are just representatives of the developer um, subdivision. They were trying to learn more about it. So they could do stuff in their own neighborhood. But it's pretty interesting. Made a bunch of popular was happy because they got the street fixed in the backyard. Big concern with it. Had dogs, the stream had rivers under the fence, and the dogs were escaping and stuff. And so we kind of did a little bit of extra work to fix up this fence so the dog would get out from it. It's kind of interesting. That's a lot of softer techniques in a way, you know, fabrics and the core logs. Yeah, they're pretty much, they do all bioengineering, um, not hard stuff. So they're not getting time for me, it's part of the project. Um, so it's all core matting in the five states. Um, with that, I think we're down to the last item, which is nomination for March officers election. I think we can or cannot take, I mean, we don't have to take formally nominations on the floor. We can take nominations all the way up to the moment we vote, which would be in March, I believe, if we're at, during the March meeting. Um, we can also, I think, Wayne can receive nominations via email if you want to do that because they will be publicly announced at the next meeting. So if you're considering, um, and I know Reverend Taylor has noted that he would like to run for chair again. And I, I guess I would like to formally nominate him if I can. Can I do that? Yeah, yeah. I'd like to. I think he's not here to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm allowed to do. So yeah, I want to say let's yeah, let's do it again, Reverend Taylor. Um for him. So I, I think I'd like to that would suggest that he was nominated for that. So but if anybody else would I guess vice chair, I don't know how we do this. Of course, because you want to run against the vote. Yeah, can we nominate? I'll, I'll do it. Yes, I have no problems doing it. If there's anybody else really wants to do it, I would think we'll hold up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I would. I'd like to, if anybody has a desire, internally talk to know what the job is entailed. So, the hardest work in the last two meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly, I'm over here. I have not been in a lot. So. And that's it. All right, meeting. I guess call for a meeting to adjourn. Hey, one other comment. I think you know, Terrell and Barrett were right that you know, the last time we looked at where you qualified under the, the terms of the drainage assistance project, but I said it's still going to be heartburn that that could have been stolen by the homeowners that are out there. We don't know. We're going to fix it in their mistake. Um, but I would like, as part of SMAC's agenda, to, to look at how we can address that problem so we're not allowing people to put in. Undersized pipes now that are going to be fixed in five years from now. I mean, that may end up being a drainage permit, which we can say has been avoided for years and years, but that may be the only solution. Yeah. Does that mean that there's maybe a little more research and then burden a little bit to Chaz's group before it comes to us and say, well, we think we've tracked down the possible reasons for it, or does that mean we reprioritize the list of something, or do you know what that means? Well, I think the problem is that. When city regulates new development, but they regulate 
the subdivision this week. I'll look at the roads, they'll look at the pipes that are associated with the road drainage system. But they don't look at the drainage on the private property after that. So somebody can come in and install like that size of 30 inch quarter gate or concrete pipe is probably done by the builder. That's something homeowners probably not going to put in. But the builder puts it in. If it's desired, or should be a 42 or a 50, they put in a 30 because it's cheaper. And there's nothing to stop them from doing that unless we require a permit or have some way of making sure that they properly size that pipe before it goes in or it becomes the city's drainage system. Um, you know, we don't have public easements, we have private easements, so he's got to apply by that. We don't look at that. So we need to find a system that we can capture them somehow so we don't let somebody put in the walls on this pipe that we got to deal with. So it's not an inspection issue? It's not inspection. It's a permitting and inspection. I mean, they're not going to go out there and inspect it unless there's a permit involved. And so either as part of the building permit or a separate drainage permit. So it's a solution problem. It's a lot of permitting. So I mean, if it's costing seven fifty thousand dollars for each project, I think somebody to get permits might be valuable. As yeah. Well. Other examples change the drainage assistance qualification and scoring requires some more mystery. Yeah. And it's going to take some investigation, and it may not be something the city wants to entertain. But I just feel bad about us spending city money on something that may be a private problem. In this case, Denver was a private problem. Yeah. No, good comment. We'll definitely take that back and think about this thing. So what's the threshold for a permit? That Barbara's already solved it. Mm -hmm. She's yeah. working on a private uh, storm drain experiment with the normal machine. We kind of created a permit system for for uh, pipe and uh, ground on. So, and then we've been avoiding that for years yeah. anyway because the burn that creates, but I think we start seeing more of these yeah. now that we've gotten to the point where so we're hoping that's the only one of System now, we might as well go to the pipe floor. Yeah, we're hoping that take effect at the same time as the storm water requirement. That's a grimace of the things for the main thing. Yeah, you're kind of like. If I could just make yes. one more on the on the election, too, the, your, your bylaws only require chair and vice chair. We have added the position of planning commission liaison, too. So if y'all would want to continue that that would be part of this nomination process and, and election process next month to not require but um seems to be working well and so i you know consider that position as part of this as well be my suggestion thank you and on that anybody want to make a motion or anybody else has anything to say and we need some more well, katie thank you again thank you so my pleasure and motion to adjourn. Motion. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Aaron, second by Barrett, and all we're going to adjourn. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.